Um, I'm Sewell Chan. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Texas Tribune. I joined this organization in October of 2021 uh, after a long career in newspapers, um, including most recently the Los Angeles Times. Uh, this has been a wild ride for me to be in Texas over the last 15 months. You know, it's a really quiet news environment. <laughs> you know, ver very tranquil, not, you know, not, not a lot going on. Uh, very relaxing, uh, not. <laughs> um, th but this will be my first ledge, and so you know I've been uh, I've been preparing. It's it's like training for a marathon, and uh, our staff is really really excited about this. So I'm particularly excited about this panel because I think um, if I do this right, this is going to be the least wonky panel today. Uh, sorry sorry for all the policy analysts here. But um, these three distinguished uh, people have just been elected to the ledge. And I really want to talk from kind of a human perspective about why they ran, what they hope to accomplish, and what it's like being newly elected and get the insights from them. They're going to learn the parliamentary procedures if they haven't already learned them. But I think it's really, really fun to actually get your perspective before you've started this incredible journey. So with that said, I'm going to start um, uh, introductions um, um, from your left to right. Um, first, I'm proud to introduce Salman Bojani, who was elected to House District 92, 92 representing Ulysses, uh, um, Bedford, Hearst, Bedford and Hearst, and par parts of Arlington and Grand Prairie, and parts of Fort Worth in the Dallas uh, area. Um, so, um, Mr. Bojani's life story is just truly remarkable. Don't know how many of you heard the Texas Standard interview, but Mr. Bojani was born in Pakistan, immigrated to the U.S. when he was 19, started off working in gas stations, supporting his family and saving for college. He earned a B.A. from UT Dallas and a law degree from Southern Methodist University. After law school, he worked at Hayden's and Boone, the largest law firm in North Texas, and went on to found his own practice in 2015. Um, Mr. Bojani is one of the uh, 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 is one of the first um, uh, is is the first Muslim and first South Asian elected to the Texas Legislature, along with uh, Representative Elect Lalani, also elected in this cycle. Please give him a huge round. Thank you. Tremendous accomplishment. That's great. Um, Morgan Lamantia, uh, in the middle here, is the senator-elect from Texas Senate uh, to represent the newly drawn Senate District 27, which spans eight counties and runs along the Gulf Coast from the border of Mexico to the coastal bend, and includes three ports, a spaceport, Padre Island, oil and gas industries, wind farms, ag farms, and thousands of acres of ranch land. It's one of the geographically largest Senate districts. No, no, well, not the largest. The largest would is be- Is in West Texas. Yes. Yeah, Yes. but large. But it is, it's about eight counties. <laughs> um, Senator-elect La Mantilla is a uh, native of the Rio Grande Valley and a sixth generation of Texas. Sixth generation Texan who represents the next generation of leadership in her family business, supporting over 1,200 jobs. She attended and graduated from the UT Macomb School of Business right here uh, on this campus and um, interned with the Texas House, the US Senate, and the Texas Railroad Commission. After graduating from UT, Ms. Lamantia continued her education, getting a law degree from St. Mary's University School of Law, and she currently heads up data analytics and serves as in-house counsel for LNF Distributors, her family's business. Welcome, Ms. Lamantia. Thank you. And then finally, State Representative-elect Charles Cunningham uh, has been a longtime leader in Harris County. He won the open Republican primary in House District 127 with a resounding 79% of the vote and did not face a general election opponent because uh, you were the only person on the ballot. If that isn't resounding uh, support from the district, I don't know what is. Um, Mr. Cunningham previously served on the Humble City Council and on the Humble School Board, uh, including as board president, where he built a strong rec track record of rooting out waste, fraud, and abuse, and ensured the tax dollars were being spent wisely and for their intended purpose. Um, Mr. Cunningham also has served as the City of Humble's representative in the Houston-Galveston Area Council. An Army veteran, Mr. Cunningham recently retired after a 39-year career at what is now Centerpoint Energy. Congratulations. Thank you. And finally, Mr. Cunningham is a graduate of Our Lady of the Lake University. Well, welcome all of you. Um, I want to start by um, talking about the immediate aftermath of an election. Um, so you've won an election. We'll, we're going to get to the recount in just a moment. But you've won an election. What happens next? Do you get an email inviting you to freshman orientation? What was step number one? 
Yeah, I, I can go if, if you'd like. Yeah, so um, I got an obviously email a couple of weeks ago for a freshman orientation, and it's been a really, really great uh, experience getting to know my colleagues and, and meeting them and trying to see how much we can do for our districts. It is so important to really make sure that we are representing our districts. People of the district has, have elected us to do the great work that we are, will be doing next session. And it's nice to have all the freshmen together. In fact, I created a text message group uh, with all the freshmen together, Republicans, Democrats alike, and try to give a lot of resources as we learn so much information about ethics, about you know budget and all that. So it's really, really nice to be able to work cordially in a respectful manner and, and, and stand true to our values. How, how large is the freshman cohort? It's, I think, about 24 new members, and then there are four that are returning. Uh, Representative John Lujan, Representative, uh, uh, who, who am I thinking? Um, for, former, yes, four, mem for, former members former that have come members. back or okay. have been elected, like Jolanda Jones and others. What's the format of the orientation? Yeah. Drinking from a fire hose. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the first two days are the new members from the House and the new members from the Senate are together. And then the Senate has one day for just Senate orientation where we split up and meet with the Senate administration and uh, Senate Secretary Patsy Spall and learn about the differences on the Senate side. Whereas the House, I believe, has two days afterwards. Yeah, it seemed like three days. <laughs> I was here on Monday and left on Saturday, so <laughs> I can't tell you. What was it like meeting? Um, how much time did you have for just kind of getting to know each other as people? And I'm assuming that a lot of these new lawmakers coming from other parts of the state you had not met previously? Yes, it was. Uh, we had a lot of time actually, because uh, we had uh, lunches, dinners, and a lot of time in the middle to really meet our, our colleagues. Um, and, and it was really great, you know, because we, we had a lot of uh, thinking about how we can work together, getting to know our families, getting to know about our kids, you know, because there's a lot of human aspect to this that. If we can get a good relationship with our colleagues, I think we'll be able to make laws that are much better. And I will say what's great about orientation, and because a lot of us don't know each other, is that we walk into the room, all of us being equal and on the same footing, and it wasn't, what party do you belong to? You sit on the left side or the right side. It was, we all sat at the same table, started talking to each other, really getting to know each other, and being able to talk about our districts, and you get to see the passion that everyone talk, you know, has for their district and for what we're going to be doing and how great it's going to be to work together, regardless of party or regardless of background or what area of the state you come from. So it was a really wonderful experience. What was the biggest surprise from the orientation? Let me know. Yeah, I mean, I, I can go. Sorry, I don't want to take up the mic a lot, but I think there are so many uh, people, so many representatives that are newly incoming, that are staffers, that have had so much experience in the House or the Senate, that are business owners, that are like different, like engineers. And so I, I feel that we'll have a really diverse group with a lot of diverse perspectives to be able to make laws that are better for the entire state of Texas. And another big surprise is just how many people actually work at the uh, state Senate and the House and the state Capitol year round, and how much effort it takes behind the scenes to be, get this, these bills passed. So the Capitol works at its you know, best and efficient and it, just all the background work that you don't know about and you don't see and you don't hear about being just a normal constituent. And so now when you get in there and you get to meet with all these wonderful staffers that absolutely love what they do, it's amazing. And these are largely career folks. These are. These are very much career folks. They're about the institution. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I was just going to add that each day uh, it, there was always something different. I mean, you know, the first day we were meeting with the House administration and, and their staff, or maybe I'll back up. I think the speaker actually had his folks come and meet with us and all what they, you know, what they do, their various different departments. Uh, House administration meeting with those folks and, and what they do. Uh, finally, I think toward the end, we actually got to go to the uh, to the House floor. Yes. And, uh, you know, that was good after a long going over budgets, appropriations, all that good stuff. And just a little funny joke. My wife always says, don't tell jokes. But uh, <laughs> right toward the end of the day, uh, I'm with one of our colleagues, uh, Stan, and, and we're sitting down and we're talking about maybe being desk mates. And all of a sudden, Stan drops a card and he reached down to get it and he fell. And you heard this loud, but he was okay. He fell, you know, and he got up and he's like, oh, Charles, I feel bad about that. And I says, oh, well, don't worry about it, Stan. 
about maybe 10 minutes later, somebody taps me on the shoulder and says, wake up. So, so I kind of like fell asleep. So I looked at Stan and I says, look, we can't be deskmates. <laughs> you, you've got to protect me. So, but overall, it was, you know, it was, it was good just kind of getting, getting to know everybody, you know. So, uh, you know, sharing, as I said, our passions, what our plans are, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, what our plans are, you know, you know, the, you know, the campaigns that we ran on. Mine was relatively easy because I ran on, you know, public safety, flooding, schools, border, and my race was over with in March. So you've had a lot of time to think about this. Well, I had a lot of time to go and visit all the stakeholders and exactly see what was going on. I had a lot of time to get, I'm sorry about this, Solomon, but you're good, but I had a lot of time to get a jump on what good staff we do have. Uh, and so it, uh, it's, it's, it's been gradually building up. I think it'll all set in. Uh, well, somebody told me I've got till December, I mean, uh, January 10th at 10 o'clock to change my mind. If, <laughs> Now, you've all run things before, obviously, um, but serving in the Texas legislature is something, is something else. How have you gone about the process of assembling your teams? I presume that many of you have folks in your campaigns that you've brought on, but you're also going to have you know, other roles that you need filled. How have you gone about the process of team building? Yeah, so I've been really fortunate. Uh, as soon as I won my uh, primary in March, um, I had a wonderful state representative uh, send me an email that their chief of staff uh, would, would love to get a job with, with our office. And she's sitting right here, Brianna Menard, and I'm so blessed to have her as a chief of staff. And so I got started really early. Yeah, please clap for her. Yep. I think every opportunity as state representatives and state senators that we get to sh give a shout out to our staff, that is what's going to be key because they are the actual ones that do the job for us and they work year, year long for us. So I'm really, really blessed to have a good chief of staff. We're looking for a legislative director. We're looking for a communication director. We're, we want to make sure that we do a lot of work. That's why my constituents have sent me to Austin to make sure that we are able to support all the work that they have. And so really blessed to have those kind of uh, situations where we can bring people on board. There are some people that we'll be bringing on for from the campaign side. And we need to also hire a district director as well because we need to do all the work. There are a lot of people, members have told me, like that no, people make mistakes by coming to Austin and seeing this shiny thing here, but then forgetting their constituents who actually elected them. And so we, I don't want to make that mistake for sure. Yeah, and I'd just like to add, you know, staff, staff is important. Uh, you know, fortunately for me, I spent 12 years on the Humble School Board. Uh, it's not all about the board members, but it's about the staff, you know, the personnel that's there. Uh, spent two terms at Dumble City Council, same thing about the staff. So I was fortunate enough, and I don't see my chief of staff here, but I have a chief of staff, uh, Royal Benavides, who s served on the uh, uh, Homeland Security under Chairman White. And of course, I've got my uh, legislative director right there, Ian McPherson. And so uh, you got, uh, yeah, you give, give Ian a hand. Uh, and then of course, I've already already got a district director also. So we're, we're ready to get back and just make sure that we're doing what the people sent us to do. And so I was very lucky with my chief of staff. I've known him for quite a number of years. When I worked um, at the Capitol in 09, during the 09 session, I was a senior at college. He was a senior in high school and would come in and to the office every once in a while because it was his dad's office. And like you said, to always give credit to your staff, he's gonna hate me for pointing him out, but it's Reed Johnson right here in front. <laughs> And he actually came on when I decided to run. I gave him a call and said, hey, calling in that favor, need your help, come on down to the valley. And I told him, I promise you will blend in. And he's over six feet tall and stuck out like a sore thumb. But I always found him. So it was very, I was very, very lucky. Now, talk to me a little bit about the process of learning your districts, because um, obviously, Mr. Cunningham, Mr. Bajani, you've served on city councils. Ms. Lamantia, this is your first time in public office. Of course, over the past several months, you've gotten to know, you know, the, the landscape, literally, that you're representing. Um, Ms. Lamantia, you'll be representing nearly a million people, about 950,000. And then um, the two representatives will be representing about uh, 190, 200,000 people. That's a lot more constituents than you've had before. How did you get to know them? How are you getting to know them? Yes, so it has been a wonderful experience campaigning and getting out into those communities and being able to talk to as many people as possible. That was one of the main things we did. It wasn't just about talking to leadership. We were out in the communities as much as we could, 
talking to people one-on-one and understanding what their issues were. It didn't matter what party they were from. It didn't matter what area or their background. We wanted to talk to everyone because this district is so large and is so diverse. And there's so much going on that I wasn't aware of. And it was a blessing to have that opportunity to get to learn about it. And those are contacts that I've kept, contacts that still reach out to me daily and just, you know, we check in and make sure that we're fighting for what matters most and what they're talking about on the kitchen table when they go home. Yeah, for me, um, it was really, I was really blessed to serve on city council, like you pointed out, for three years and also serve as mayor pro tem for the city of Euless. Uh, and, and I was, you know, so I already know some of the people. They, they, I met them at the grocery store. I met them at the city hall. But as I was knocking on doors, because that's what you have to do. But we, by the way, we knocked on 45,000 doors uh, in our district. And, and that's how I was able to get. Yeah, sure. You can clap for that. It took a lot of hard work. Uh, but, you know, I, I talked to them about my passion to serve. And when I talked to them about my 2018 race, when I was elected as the first minority ever elected in the history of the city of Euless, uh, they apparently knew that story because my own state representatives, uh, one state representative that you may be familiar with at that time, no names taken, but um, he, he attacked me for being Muslim and he attacked me for being an immigrant, for being a Democrat, for being an attorney. And that actually made national news at that time. And so there were so many constituents that knew about that story that this representative had attacked someone. They did not know it was me. And so when I told them that story, they were like, wow, I'm, we're definitely voting for you because we don't want, you know, we want people down the middle. And because you've served on city council, and, and by the way, uh, in my city council term, there were seven city council members. I was the only Democrat and the only minority. My, the other six uh, colleagues that were Republicans actually elected me as a mayor pro tem for the city of Euless. That meant a lot to me. How I was able to work across the aisle with them and really pass meaningful legislation in our city of Euless. And so that's how I was able to sort of connect a lot with, with our district. A reminder that sometimes attacks have unintended consequences. <laughs> I would just say it, it, it's the same thing. It's about knowing your district. And, and I've been in, the, uh, in that uh, Northeast uh, Harris County area for over 40 years, uh, served in uh, uh, as a servant in every capacity from nonprofits to my church. Uh, and, I, and I wanna take a pause and say, let me not forget the, the one that really allows me to do what I do. And it's my wife, Stella, who's also here with me today. Uh, but it's, 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 it's knowing your district. And I, I think that's why I was so blessed that when I did put my name in the hat, uh, it was a name that people knew. You know, they knew me from, like I said, my nonprofit service. Uh, HAM is one of our local organizations that gives the needies. Uh, being on the school board for 12 years, prior to uh, on the school board for 12 years, I was a volunteer in the school district for 13 years. And then going to city council and, and, and working, you know, with the city. And so now just taking that next step up just to encompass uh, all the uh, residents uh, in District 127. Now, each of you represents very different parts of the state, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, the uh, Houston area, and, uh, and of course the Rio Grande Valley, very distinctive. And you're not only representing your specific constituencies, but now you're hopefully legislating on behalf of the whole state of Texas. What has your learning curve been like as you're learning about the statewide issues, including learning about districts and places that are very different from your own? Go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, you know, during freshman orientation, that was that was a good, uh, as you say, learning curve. You know, learning from where everybody's at, what are all the needs and stuff. And, and there were some similarities. I know uh, one of the reps that was in Beaumont, uh, and then Josie Garcia, she's in San Antonio. We really hit it off, especially concerning, you know, uh, in the area around uh, special needs kids. And so, you know, those are the things we say there's some similarities there. And then we're talking about, well, in my district, you know, flooding is, is an issue. You know, Hurricane Harvey came and, and just devastated uh, our particular area there. And so just learning the different issues of what's, you know, what's going on, what are their needs, and, and realizing in the back of your mind, you're not only there for your district, but you're there for the people of Texas also. It's very true, and like flooding is an issue in your district, it's a very big issue in my district as well. So working on flooding infrastructure and drainage, that's gonna help a lot of different areas of the state. And I was able to talk to Senator Lex Sparks as well, and he's in West Texas and has a very large area, but there's a lot of similarities between my district and his. You know, we have a lot of 18-wheelers driving through on, very, um, on roads that were built by small, small towns and rural communities that aren't able to withstand these 
large loads and large trucks going over and across all the time. So we can work together on infrastructure bills. It's gonna help not just our areas, but a lot of rural areas throughout the state. So though it's very diverse, though there's a lot of issues across the state, there are a lot of similarities. Yeah, for me, I think my entire life has, has prepared me to be a successful state representative. Like, as you mentioned, you know, born in, in Pakistan, coming as an immigrant, working at gas stations, mopping floors, cleaning restrooms, and stocking shelves for $6 an hour, you know, going up and going to law school in the evening program at SMU, and working really hard towards it, being really studious, being really thoughtful, then getting elected on Eula City Council and trying to really govern with a body that was not completely had the same values and, and you know, trying to see how the, our potholes are not Republican or Democrat, right? We're, we're together as one state and one country. How can we work together? So all that has really prepared me to be a successful state representative. And we've talked about issues all the time, especially one of them is local control. I come from a city background. I feel like we need to make sure that we are giving our cities and municipalities and school districts more uh, leverage on what laws that they will be making because they're more closer to the ground. We saw our, our constituents a lot, and I think in, in cities get that, what people are looking for. So my, my first reaction will be to get, provide more deference to the municipalities and school boards, uh, but also to work on really meaningful legislation. As I've knocked on doors, I've, I've learned that people care about their children's education. People care about their health care. They need access to healthcare, especially with the pandemic, how it's had such a huge learning gap. How do we close that gap? I've learned as a, as a small business owner myself, and while knocking on doors, people really care about their, their businesses. They're hurting right now with inflation being so high. We need to work as one state uh, state representatives and House members and Senate members to try to really fix these things for them. So let's stay on the issues now. I'm so glad we've started this discussion. I'd like each of you to complete the following uh, statement. Um, my district most wants leaders in Austin, wishes that leaders in Austin would understand. Well, I'm going to do this thing again. Would you repeat the question? My district <laughs> most wishes that leaders in Austin would understand. My district wish leaders in Austin would most understand. Or better, or better understand. Or better understand, uh, I would say, uh, the need to uh, service, uh, you know, our areas, and and I say that because you know, you know, in 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 Austin, you know, there's what eight seven thousand bills that are passed, and how many bills actually become law, and so we want to be you know pass meaningful legislation. Uh, I think I shared with you earlier. I'm, I'm a limited government guy. I believe government should protect, punish, and promote. And that's what we need to be doing. So those bills should be doing one of those three things, protecting our citizenry, protecting our borders, punishing those. And Harris County, the county I live in, we have an issue about punishing because we've got, uh, you know, people out on bond that are, you know, committing, committing heinous crimes. Uh, one of the gentlemen that uh, lives in my area, uh, Ersan, uh, a constable, was, was killed by somebody out on bond, murder. Uh, he was going to the store to buy food for his family, and he got shot and killed. And you know, my wife and I are no different. We're at our home, four o'clock in the morning. We hear a loud bang. I thought I thought somebody was breaking in, so I grabbed my second wife and I went downstairs uh, to see what was going on. And lo and behold, I've got a Chevy pickup that's just driven through my house. You know, long story short, the people that stole the pickup a couple of blocks over were out on bond, and so. I think the thing is, you know, the people in my district want people in Austin to address their needs. Uh, you know, let's, let's get meaningful legislation. Uh, and that, that would be the short, well, the long answer to a short one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think I'd complete the sentence by saying so. It was what I wish our legislators in Austin would best understand. What your district wishes. What my district wishes would best understand is that Family is the most important thing. So when we're going out talking to our constituents and talking about what matters most to them, it comes down to family. They want to make sure that their family's healthy, that when they get sick, they can see a doctor. It's affordable. It's accessible. They want to make sure that their kids have an education so that they can get those high-paying jobs after they graduate from high school or and have the opportunity to go to college if they wish to go. 
They want to make sure that they can continue to provide for the family and keep a roof over their heads, that they can get to and from work and don't have to worry about their houses being flooded should it rain or a storm come in. So what that comes down to is infrastructure, education, and health care. Because we always know that if we can take care of our family, if we can educate our kids, if we can train our workforce, Texas is one of the greatest states, and we're going to continue to grow our economy. And in that regard, we're going to keep having these strong Texas leaders. Yeah, so after knocking on 45,000 doors, I've learned that our, our constituents think that the legislator ha legislature has really fallen completely as different from what the people want. And the people want to have bring compassion, bring uh, respect into our political discourse, to reduce the polarization, and, and to fight for people who do not have a vo voice in our political system. For example, uh, and, and they want, to, want us to focus on like more kitchen table issues than the issues that unfortunately we've been focusing on quite a lot is how to uh, target transgender kids. You know, try to you know see how uh, LGBTQ like you know that that no, nobody cares about those kind of people. The kids that that passed away at the Uvalde shooting, it is really the parents have not forgotten about that. The, the people are still seeing that and saying we need to stop this from happening again and again and again. And this session will define how we really take care of our kids in the most important place where they should be learning. We need to stop that. So that, that's what they're trying to think about. How do we work on kitchen table issues like the economy, like the healthcare, like the education? That's what they care about more than what we are really focusing on these days. How much of a chance do you all have to discuss values? You know, even, um, and I've asked pretty, you know, uh, uh, um, pretty general questions so far, but, you know, I've already heard some differences of view, right? Differences about the, the role of government in public life, the scope of government, how much government there should be. You know, Texas famously has legislature meet for 140 days every two years. You know, the joke is that many would prefer that the legislature meets two days every 140 years. Uh, <laughs> And um, you know it's a limited government state. It's a part-time legislature. You're all paid very modestly, of course. Uh, and and you know you're this isn't your full-time job. You're you're doing this. Well, it is a full-time job, but on top of whatever else it is you're doing, right? You're people who are what? So how how I mean, is there a space for the discussion of those values? That, you know, before you get to the specifics of you know bill number this. I think the values that we discussed were like in the freshman orientation, right? What, what do we want to accomplish as one body together? And I, I really, that the over, overwhelming uh, sentiment was that we want to respect each other, right? We want to learn from each other. We want to talk about our children's stories. We want to talk about what inspires us to run for office and do the great things that we're doing or we will be doing for our constituents. And I think that really defines us in, in the state house. And, I mean, coming from a district that may be, you know, there, there's some activist, right, on, on like 10%, maybe on this side, 10% on that side, but the middle people that sometimes, unfortunately, do not come out to vote have, have told me, you know, that, that we need to come together. But the, the activists have said, hey, don't, don't talk to the other party. Don't talk to the other side. But when we have come together, it has been such a cordial relationship. And that's what, at the end of the day, people want to see. People want to see their elected representatives being respectful to each other, not putting them down, actually uplifting those members of our community that are actually needing the most amount of help. And I think that's exactly what we teach our kids, right? To be compassionate, to be kind, to be respectful to one another. And that's what I've seen in the, in, in the fresh com freshman class that I was able to come in. I go back to uh, what really is just, uh, you know, over the years, just really driven me just to be a servant and serve. And, and we stated that it is about family, uh, but more in particular about my family. You know, as I walk through those doors on January 10th uh, and, and raise, that, raise that hand, uh, I go back to my great-great-grandfather, and he actually served in the Texas legislature back in 1873. His picture is on the wall when you walk through the South entrance. And so to actually have him serve there then, back in that time, and fast forward, that the great great grandson is coming there to serve. You know, it's about family. It, you know, it's about you know uh, wanting people to you know treat you well. You treat people the way you want to be treated, and it's all about us. And it's really, as I tell them, it's not about us. It's about the next generation. That's what we're fighting for. I know that's what I'm fighting for. Is that next generation? 
it's incredibly powerful. How much did you know about your great grandfather growing up? A little bit uh, from my, uh, my from my grandmother and my aunts and stuff because uh, as a, as a family of resilience, you know, we were uh, you know back in you know the 1940s and 30s, uh, you know, they were able to survive. And yeah, you know, kind of like the story with the Kennedys bootlegging. Well, yeah, my family did a lot of bootlegging and stuff. Okay. <laughs> But uh, my mother, and, and we're all from Texas, and my mother, you know, in the 50s, decided to move elsewhere, and so she went out and, and, and moved to New Mexico. And, and that's where I was born, born in uh, New Mexico. And my joke about New Mexico is a little town called Artesia. Uh, up until 1912, it was actually in Texas, until Texas became a state. So I got back as soon as I could to <laughs> Texas. <laughs> but, what, um, what district did your ancestor represent? It was the 13th district back then, and that represented uh, Richmond, Fort Bend, and Wharton County. And he was obviously the first in the first generation of of black elected lawmakers. You know, not long, during the Reconstruction era. That is just remarkable. Um, of course, he was a Republican like you. Um, Absolutely. The the uh, 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 you know the parties, uh, both parties, both parties are not not quite what they were uh, uh, back then. Why, for you, was being has being a Republican been so important? It, it, it's really about the values. You know, as I said, I'm I'm a limited government guy. You know, and you know, family is very important. You know, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm a deacon at my church. Uh, it's those values that I was 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 reared in, and my wife and what we you know taught our kids in, and, and we've experienced you know from going to private school to public school, trying to provide all the, you know, all the, you know, the advantages, the challenges, and, and, and plus failing, you know, let your kids fail, you know, if you call them all the time and they, you know, they never know what failure is, and then all of a sudden, you know, when they do have it, it's a catastrophe, you know, uh, I, I like, I'm, I'm what you call a Booker T. Washington guy, and then I've got some of, some of the folks in my community that are, that are W.E. Du Bois, so I'm that Booker T. Washington guy, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. And every generation's had that debate, right? I mean, Martin and Malcolm and yep. further on. Ms. Lamantia, what, what, what will it mean for you to take the oath on, on, in January, especially Sorry. as your first time in public office? Can you repeat the question? What will it mean, what does it mean to you, what will it mean to you when you raise your hand to take the oath? It's gonna mean a great deal to me. My grandfather, who started our family business that I work in now, he came down to South Texas without a college degree, without a high school degree. He was 17 years old and started working on farms, and he built a business slowly, step by step. Where did he come from? Uh, Chicago. His grandfather, my great-grandfather, came from Italy when he was eight years old to Chicago. And so our family has many generations of pulling themselves up by the bootstraps and working hard, and he taught my parents, to, you know, my father and his siblings, that you need to work hard, you need to take care of those you work with, and you need to rebuild our company. Everyone is a family, and we all help out and try to help each other as much as possible. And that's what we learned as well. We learned about the value of hard work. I've been working the family company one way or another since the sixth grade, sweeping floors, and then answering phone calls, and when I got a driver's license, it was put out on a route. So. It was been a very, very great experience. And in that experience, I've been able to meet so many people and learn about so many different issues. And on my mom's side, many generations back, we have a US Supreme Court justice as well. So it's a great legacy on both sides of the family that I'm very excited to continue. Which ancestor is that? Um, his name was uh, Justice Peckham. So that was, I don't know, 12 great grandfathers ago. <laughs> uh, and he was a Texan, of course. Um, no, he wasn't. Oh, he, he was, was New York. He, he was New York. Uh -huh. Yes. Serving yes. in which period? 19th century? Yes. Okay. Amazing. Amazing. And you, what, it will, what will it mean when you take the oath? Yeah, and I've thought about this moment for quite some time, uh, being the first Muslim and the first South Asian ever elected in the history of the state of Texas. What does that mean to me and, and to our community? Because it's not only our victory, but it's also a, a victory that is for a lot of the Muslim and South Asian communities which, who have never seen one of their own in the halls of the state house. And so I'll be telling their stories. It also means for, for my personal family as well. My daughter inspires me and my entire family inspires me to do the great things that I do. So my daughter runs cross country every morning. She wakes up at 5.30 to run 5K. 
and you know just the perseverance that it takes a lot. My son, he has filed two patents. He's an Eagle Scout. He actually knows every single member of the House and Senator a lot, and, and I think I've talked about that in my in my freshman of orientation. the Texas House and Senate and Congress and New York. Like he knows, he's a political geek. <laughs> so. He has bought the domain he name. He worked on your campaign, I hope. Oh, absolutely. We could not have won without him. He knocked on doors as well and was yelling at in the, you know, as pe you know, people coming to vote and said, hey, vote for my dad, vote for my dad. It was really, really nice. How, so how old is him. he? He's 17 years old and he's already bought the domain name Borjani for Congress. Not for me, <laughs> for himself. <laughs> right? And, and, and thank you so much. So, and that's what it for, means to me when I hold my hand um, and, and swear and, and get sworn in. I think it's a lot of youth that are in our communities that have not gotten ever a chance to step in the state house, to step in the government positions. And I want to give them an, an opportunity to see that and hopefully build on the pipeline because I'm the first Muslim and the first South Asian. I don't want to be like, there should be men, multiple people coming down that path and being able to represent that community that has not gotten a voice. And so really blessed. In fact, I, I tried to see if I can get the Thomas Jefferson's copy of the Quran to swear in on, uh, which our, our Congressman uh, Keith Ellison swore in on as well. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to get that, but you know, we'll, we'll try to see how we can really make a, a big statement on what we swear in on, because that's what's gonna define us for, se for several generations. People will look at that, and so we'll do something meaningful. If these aren't incredible American stories, I don't know what is. And you talk about the selfie page that your son told you to do. Oh, yeah, sure, I'm, yes. I'm happy to say that. So uh, my son has given me a great idea. I, I love taking selfies. In fact, right before this session was starting, I told Sewell that can we take a quick selfie? He said right after, so we'll be taking a selfie for sure. Uh, <laughs> but he, he gave me an idea of taking, like, so I've taken probably 50 or 60 selfies with state representatives, state senators, congressmen and congresswomen. And so he put that all on our page. So if you go to bojanifortexas.com, you'll see a pay, uh, something called Selfies with Salman. And you can click on that and then you'll be able to see all the selfies we've taken. So he's in charge of that project and he's building that. And so he, uh, I was there in DC a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. He introduced me to, he set this whole thing up himself by the staff of uh, Jake Elzey, the Congressman Jake Elzey. Yeah. So I took a selfie with him and he was very proud to put that on there. And he's actually the one that keeps saying, we need to reduce the polarization in this country. We've had too much of that. There are people in the middle that unfortunately are not really activated to vote, but we will get them out. And that's why he was a big proponent of uh, knocking on 45,000 doors and making 25,000 phone calls. And bringing, we brought 1,000 first time voters out to vote for us because they had never been engaged in a meaningful way. So really blessed to have, like that's why, I mean, I've got a great family. I'm telling you, like if you see that I've, I've done even 1%, I have, my family has 99% of the influence on me and they've done so much better than me. And by the way, I just want to recognize my wife, Nima. She's probably watching this. She's an amazing spouse. And I think we could not have done anything without her spouse. Yeah, please, yeah, give her a round of applause. So blessed to have her by my side every single time. Every single time I said, we'll go to law school, okay? I'm, I'm with you. I'm gonna run for city council, okay? I'm with you. I'm gonna run for state house, I'm with you. And now I'm gonna be gone to Austin for six months I'm with you, right? That she still keeps on saying that. I think I may get fired soon if I, if I don't stop doing too many more things. <laughs> well, so after we can have a line in the back, selfies with Salmon, yes? I yes? I would love that. Well, and, and just hearing about your son, I mean, Gen Z does, I think, offer some hope that they're not, they don't, they didn't grow up with the same assumptions that maybe, you know, uh, today's leaders did. And, and perhaps there is some hope for greater bipartisanship and, and a seriousness about issues. Um, your comments about your social media manager and communications director um, lead me to ask next about your comm strategy. You know, um, and we know this from working in the press that you know the nature of how one communicates with constituents and voters has changed dramatically. You know, formal press releases have often been superseded by communicating directly with folks. Have you thought about um, either you know your your strategy? Is it going to be more social media? Do you feel under pressure to kind of communicate? on social media more or is it newsletters or is it or is it town halls you know wh wh how do you think your comm strategy uh, is going to uh, is going to take shape over the next year well during this during the session uh, you know it will will probably you know by email well let me just back up I, I think I'm gonna be in good hands because my district director uh, her name is Cynthia Calvert Cynthia if you're watching hello uh, she used to own the local newspaper and so I've got somebody that's been in journalism for 40 plus years and she knows the district, knows the area. And so I'm going to be in good hands with her, especially as we get our message out to let the folks know what are we doing 
uh, for him in Texas. Uh, I'm not really, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a baby boomer, all right? I'm just not gonna just tell the truth. I got a pen right here that proves it. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, social media, I'm, I'm, I'm learning how to deal with it, but I've got, I've got the team and they're, you know, they're saying, Charles, you gotta get out there. And so they're putting pictures here. I go places and I forget to take pictures. And I, Look, I need more pictures, need more pictures. Oh yeah, okay, we'll take one. So, and I'm glad. Solomon, he's sending me all the pictures he's taking, so I'm sending them, so. But it'll, it'll be a combination of, you know, some type of e-blast newsletters, what's going on, you know, back in the district. Uh, hopefully after session, if you have a good successful session, it'll be town halls. What did we accomplish uh, uh, during this session? And, you know, what do we look forward to accomplishing? You know, what was left on the table, as we say. And so it'll be a combination of that, a little bit of social media, Twitter, whatever all you call all that stuff. And, uh, you know, really, I, I like to FaceTime. I, I'm an I'm a in-person, in-your-face, yeah. speaking to everybody. Just, just stay off of TikTok, everyone. <laughs> yes. So it'll be a lot of social media. We used a lot of social media during the campaign, to, and we were very transparent. We wanted to make sure everyone knew where we were going, when we were going to be there, what we were doing, and what we were talking about. So we're going to continue with the social media aspect. But... Because our district is so diverse and there's a lot of uh, different ages, different people that like to receive their news in different methods. So we'll also be including email newsletters and paper and talking with our local newspapers because one of the points that we all understand, one of the points that was made to us during orientation was how important our local news is. Our local journalism, our newspapers, our radio, our TV stations because they're the ones that focal, focus most on the local issues and the issues that matter on that local level. And that's what we also really need to focus on and don't need to miss out on. So keeping constant contact with our local journalists is going to be incredibly important for us going forward. Now, Ms. Lamontia, just pause for a moment. You won your race with just over 600 some votes, 600 some votes. Your opponent has asked for a recount, as is his right. Um, it's a very divided district. How social? How do you how do you reach out to those who didn't vote for you? So how do I? How do you reach out to those who did not vote for you? So a big part of that is town halls. Invite everyone and everyone that wants to come and answer the questions. Let them ask whatever they need to, whatever they want to ask, and have honest discussions about those issues. And we are not going to agree, and I'm not going to agree with every constituent on every issue, but there's always something, there's a middle ground. There's something we can come together on, there's something we can agree on, and there's something that we can all fight for. So getting out there and talking to them as much as possible and hoping to find that middle ground. Yeah, so uh, we, in, over the campaign, we used a lot of social media, but in, in, during the freshman orientation, we actually got a session on there are different age categories, um, and they, we, we, different things appeal to them in a different way. And so that's why I think uh, Representative Cunningham mentioned about the baby boom. I'm a millennial. I love social media. I, I, I do TikToks myself as well. In fact, one of the TikToks I did. Not on your a, government devices, though. No, please. not government. Okay. <laughs> Personally, I did. You know, I was knocking on doors and putting my yard sign out. That was the 10th yard sign or something, and I made a TikTok, and that got 50,000 views. Because um, it's very, like, it's very genuine. I'm, I'm giving them, like, exactly what my personality is and what I intend on doing, as opposed to, you know, putting something, a facade up or whatnot. So I want to be genuine with them. And I look forward to doing a lot of town hall meetings, and, and I look forward to, again, continue to knock on doors. I mean, one of the things I told my district director is we should not just knock on doors during the election because that's very self-serving. I think we should knock on doors continuously, and I've, we've knocked on doors, Republicans, independents, Democrats, because that is what it takes to really get the will of the people. Because we, we keep saying we need equality regardless of you know, race, gender, sexual orientation, or religion, but I want to add political ideology to that as well, because I'm a state representative not for only Democrats and independents, I'm also a state representative for also Republican. So I want to try to get everybody on, on, the, on the same page. Well, and if I could just put in a plea, you know, please talk to media. Please talk to local media. Talk to your weekly uh, newspapers, your small town newspapers across Texas, which are really hurting, frankly, because of changes in economics. And, uh, and, and a lot of times they're family owned, but there isn't a new generation to take on the papers. Talk to ethnic media. Talk to your local community radio stations. And uh, even talk to some of the statewide media, too. <laughs> yeah, on that, on that note, like we have 757 Nigerian community members in our district. So what we did was we went to their uh, uh, church and we recruited 10 volunteers from the Nigerian community that spoke different languages 
and each one had 75 voters that they were responsible for letting us letting them know about our campaign yeah. all the way to getting them out to vote because GOTV is the most important when you talk about minority That's communities it. because they don't even know they were like can you can you tell us in our language how we're supposed to go vote and who we're supposed to go vote because they don't go vote if they don't even know what they're you yeah. know what who they're voting and, for and Nigeria is obviously so much yeah. linguistic diversity same thing with Nepal and Pakistan and all those kind of incredible I'd like to invite members of our audience to ask questions there's a microphone on the left and on the right while you are lining up a final question from me. What, um, you're newcomers, you're freshmen, you know, regardless of your age or how much you've served in other bodies or institutions or your distinguished careers, you're newcomers. How do you make your voice, how do you plan to make your voice heard when leadership is so powerful at driving the agenda in, in both parties and in both chambers? Well, and you know, and all that'll be done when we do our committee selections, well, of course, you know, and for the, uh, for the Republicans, we have our Republican caucus. And so they'll, they'll have a policy committee that'll review all the bills that are out. I, I think with, uh, as I said, with what I bring to the table, uh, being on city council uh, for four years, I know municipal, municipalities, uh, school board for 12 years, I understand public education. And then of course, uh, being an employee of Centerpoint Energy where I've worked from, from the gas to the generation to the TD, you know, TDSP, uh, I, I know the electric grid and that is, that is high on our, on, on our agenda. And so I would, uh, I would hope that the speaker would look at that. And of course, you know, I'll let him know what, my, what I bring to the table. And then I won't forget to let him know that wherever you need me, Mr. Speaker. And so, uh, but I, I, I look forward to it. And uh, I didn't come to sit and be just furniture. I came to be a part of the solution. Can you ask your question one more time? Your interactions with leadership, how do you as a, as a backbencher and as a newcomer, and, and for the two of you as a member of the minority party, how do you get your voice heard? It's working with other people. It's forming relationships. It's reaching across the aisle. It's finding that middle ground. It's listening to our other members and understanding that some of their issues are our issues as well. And there's always something that we can agree on. And there's always something we can fight for and work for. And I think there's a lot of issues when it comes to infrastructure, when it comes to education, when it comes to healthcare, when it comes to those bread and butter issues, we all agree. And so I think there's a lot of those issues that we can work together on, we can have real conversations about, and we can find long-term solutions to those problems. Yeah, so one of the first times I met the speaker was we're really in an odd place. And so I actually, um, there was a speaker had a Texas OU fundraiser in Dallas and uh, with 12 other Republican state representatives. Uh, I, I obviously am not Republican, but I'm still, I, I look forward to being a part of his you know, team. And so that's why I sort of went in and I shook his hand uh, and just was there for five minutes, met uh, Representative Morgan Lamantia as well, uh, no, uh, Representative Morgan Meyer as well, and uh, really had a great chat with him at that time. And then I met him at the orientation, right before the orientation. And I let him know that I, I do want to work across the aisle and I, I am here to work hard because if I'm, I'm away from my family, I'd rather be working even late nights in the morning for the people of Texas. That's wh wh what I've been elected for. And so, you know, I, I look forward to serving in some capacity to really build relationships. And that's what I've done in the in city council in my previous term on, like I told you guys that out of seven city council member board, six of my Republican colleagues elected me as a mayor pro tem. They could have easily picked one of their own but they picked me because I worked so hard with the Nepali community, the Tongan community, the you know, Ismaili community, the Muslim community that they had, no, no other person could be the face of Ulyss besides me. And by the way, I just wanna give a shout out to our city of Ulyss, your former uh, you know, uh, job where at New York Times. So New York Times issued an article while I was mayor pro tem and shortly thereafter that Ulyss is the best place to live in the entire country, not just in the entire state of Texas. So I probably had something to do with that in, in that. <laughs> First question. Thank you all so much for sharing your stories. Um, I believe each of you mentioned flooding as a big issue for your constituents. Whether it's um, drawing down federal infrastructure funds under the SRFs or incorporating climate change into state planning processes or giving counties the authority to adopt enforceable building code standards, what are the biggest priorities that you see um, will be for the legislative session to address flooding for your constituents? So one of the things that uh, some of the other senators put in place is called the Flood Infrastructure Fund. 
And that is a great way for our local counties and our municipalities to bring those dollars down to be able to fix their roads and their drainage systems and love to see some money from our surplus that we're walking into hopefully go to fund and put more money in that flood infrastructure fund. And also working with, so one of the things I've learned is that water does not care about county lines, city lines. So we need our counties and our cities to work together and have a plan because when they work together, that's when we're gonna have the greatest impact. And we have that overreaching plan. And of course, it comes down to bringing down those dollars and bringing down that expertise and making sure our cities and our counties have what they need to be able to do the job they were elected to do as well. Uh, I'll just echo, and I, I forget the actual name of the fund, but I believe there is a, 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 a FUD uh, the flood fund. The flood infrastructure fund. Yeah, and, and, but it's about to be de de depleted. And so we'll have to be looking at uh, getting that money back in there. Uh, in my area, uh, where I'm at, in District 127, we actually c created a flood planning committee amongst our residents. And so we've, in we've included our county commissioner, our neighboring county commissioner, our congressman, which is Dan Crenshaw, and a few of the stakeholders in that area. And so we're looking at projects that are, are important to us there. But now we've got to keep in mind now, a project in our area might be a fix there, but it might cause a problem elsewhere. And so we got to be at the 30,000 foot level as we look. Uh, I think with all the maybe 15, don't get me, hold me to it, but 15 uh, flood planning ranges, zones, whatever, we're in region six. And so uh, I know that those plans have come forward. I know that uh, they're, they're for comments now that we're looking at it. Uh, our, our group is looking at that also. There is some legislation that we're looking at uh, uh, partnering up with. I, I think uh, Representative Muir has gotten a bill. It didn't didn't pass the last session. We're looking at uh, seeing if we can get that further, you know, get it across the line. But those are the things that we're looking at. Uh, yeah. yeah, unfortunately, climate change is causing a lot of uh, catastrophes like, like flooding. Uh, in fact, in, in where I, the country that I'm born in, Pakistan had seen devastating flooding. One third of the country was in, in water. Um, it, it's home to 7,000 glaciers and they were melting like anything and that's how this, this, the, the country was in flooded. But I think we need to spend a lot of money on infrastructure and we have the extra funds to be able to, to do that uh, because climate change will bring a lot more issues that we had not previously paid attention to. So as, as, a, as a team, we need to work on, get experts on board. I'm not a flood expert at all. Uh, I need to get people that are involved, that, that, ha that know exactly what, they have, they have a master's degree in that and trying to figure out how we can really work, work together. Thank you. Next question. Uh, congratulations on all of you getting elected. And I want to thank you for your past and future service to our, your communities and the state of Texas. I was so glad that you brought up the word respect because as a former public school teacher and researcher at the University of Texas, I work on that every day. How, how are my students supposed to respect me if I don't do the same? So I, I have to work on that every day. Uh, I do want to be sure we show respect to our public school students, our public school teachers, and if you can remember the retired teachers and retired state workers, COLAs for them so that they live with respect. So uh, I want to thank you. Uh, for that, for bringing up that topic, because the infrastructure of our roads, bridges, and human capital is so important. My question to you is, how will you, what will you do to prevent another situation like what happened in Uvalde, Texas? So school safety. Yeah, so first of all, thank you for being an educator and, and thank you for uplifting the voices of people that do not have. Yeah, and, and it's really, really sad. I mean, I, I think about the parents because if this happened to me, I do not know, like I would have never not be able to forget that at all. And so we, we sometimes, you know, go about our life and just forget about what, what happened in Uvalde and other shootings. We really need to bring the human aspect to it, the family aspect to it. And these are the kids that cannot even vote for us. So we should be uplifting them more and trying to really engage them in that. And respect is obviously the starting point with all that. And so, I, look, I mean, I'm really blessed at least we're starting off with that in, in, in the freshman class. But I think we need to have more security in, in our schools. We need to make sure that we're not putting guns in hands of, of kids that even can't even buy alcohol. Uh, uh, and, and so, I, like, I can't even imagine, my son is 17 years old. If even one year later, two years later, I can't imagine him knowing how to use an automatic rifle or guns. So, 
I just feel there has to be background checks. We need to make sure that the, the mental health of, of people that are purchasing guns is sound because they're the ones that are giving other people bad name, bad name for, for owning guns. And so I think you know, we, we need to bring all the stakeholders in. We need to bring experts. I'm very big on having people that have master's degrees and all that with, with that, trying to see how we can really come up with across, whether you are or D, I think this is an issue that faces the entire state of Texas. And I think this session will be a really important and will defining session for how do we take care of gun safety. I think a big part of the solution comes down to making sure our public school systems are fully funded. We want our schools to be safe. We want our kids to be safe. We want our parents to know that when they drop their kids off, they're gonna be able to pick them up at the end of the day. And we need to make sure that our school systems have the funds that they need to be able to implement those safety measures that the experts do recommend. And we don't want our school districts to have to decide between putting in a new security system versus being able to pay their teachers. So we need to make sure that our school systems are fully funded so that they can handle both and we can have top of the line security and safety mechanisms in place at all of our schools across the board. What we also need to do is, so I've been out in the district and spoken with our chiefs of police, spoken with sheriffs, spoken with police officers, spoken with teachers and parents, and everyone agrees that we need to put in place background checks, age limits when it comes to automatic weapons, and look at red flag laws as well. And when we talk about public education and fully funding it, we also need to talk about mental health and making sure all of our schools have mental health professionals, not just to help with the kids, but the teachers and the, and the staff as well. And especially with the pandemic and our social emotional learning and our gaps there, we need the mental health care more than ever in our school systems. And the short word is no unfunded mandate. Yes. So, uh, but my wife just retired. She was an educator, school teacher. And so I, I go back, my district uh, that, I, that I'm representing, it, it touches five school districts. It touches the Huffman, uh, Umbo, New Caney, uh, uh, I got on the tip of my tongue, Aldine and Spring. And I, and I told you earlier, I met with all the stakeholders. And so I met with all the superintendents. One thing that we did in Umbo when we hired our superintendent, Dr. Elizabeth Fagan, and she came from Colorado, where you know Colorado had the Columbine. Uh, we were a fast growth school district. We actually, you know, when we were building our schools, designed them with safety in mind. And then we've got our school police. Now, I've heard that there's some legislation to get rid of school police. I, don't, you know, I hadn't read it yet, but I just heard. We, we definitely can't do that because when we look at law enforcement overall, they all have a staffing issue. So we don't have it there. But I think when we talk about, you know, what are we going to do, everything that they've just said plus more, and if we fund it uh, or if we mandate it, you know, that we mandate it with no unfunded mandate. And uh, by the way, yes, I am I'm a COLA guy. Thank you so much. Um, a, final, a final question, please. Yes, um, as a student, what insight or advice could you give to a future politician? Reserve your domain name? <laughs> <laughs> I'm building a website right now, yes. <laughs> no, I think uh, I, I talk to people all the time about running for office, but it starts several years before you run for office because if you really have the passion to serve your constituents and your people, it should, see, it should be apparent in a non-elected position. So I served in my city of Euless for three years on the Euless Park Board. Parks is why I moved to Euless because in a 16 square mile city, it has 17 parks. And so my passion was to serve there. So that's why I got on that. And then when I ran for city council, I was not an outsider, right? I, was, I knew the, how, how things work. I was, I'd already met city council members. And so I would encourage you to serve in a border commission in your city. And that's how uh, Rafael Lanchia, when I met him, Representative Lanchia had encouraged me to do that in 2017, 2013. And that's why I did that, so try to do that. I would say get out there and talk to uh, the people your neighbors, the people in your community, your city, your county, and understand their issues. See where you have middle ground, See where, and also understand what you're passionate about. If you are passionate about serving your community, start today, start now, find something that you can start working for, that you can start to fight for, for your neighbors, and make people's lives a little bit better, and continue to do that. And as you learn more about what's needed in your community, and you find it within yourself that you want to keep fighting for it, and despite 
red tape, bureaucracy, and everything else that kind of comes up and can be a roadblock, you keep fighting for that. And if you do that, and if you fight for those around you, you're going to make a really good politician. I hate to say politician, but politician, yes. Well, first, let me just say, Sewell, thank you, uh, you know, for having us up here, and, and thank all of you uh, for being here. I, I think, really, it, it, it comes down to, in, in order to lead, you must be willing to serve. And so that is, that is where it's at. You know, to be a leader of all, you must be a servant of all. And so find something that you believe in and, and go for it. Representative-elect Charles Cunningham, Senator-elect Morgan Lamantia, Representative-elect Solomon Bojani, thank you so much for this discussion.